So Steve and Melody Barons are with us here. Um, some of our staunchest supporters. Um, they've been keto for quite a long time and um, run an outfit called Tactical uh, Kitchen and just recently embarked on an experiment to go totally no carb, zero carb carnivores. And I'm kind of interested in in a number of at a number of levels here. Like, why would you do that in the first place? How difficult it was, and then you know, what were the results? How did it actually um, work out for you guys? So, you know, off we go. So, as far as like why we did it, mostly because we're rebels. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> if someone says that, you know, you can't do something, we're probably going to do it. But we really wanted to see how it would affect our health because all joking aside, we're in this uh, to help people. And we have some clients who were doing this and we couldn't really talk about it unless we had done it ourselves. Okay. We felt like we couldn't really say, yeah, you should do that, or it's worth it, or it works, unless we had actually done it. Yeah, you can't tell people they can't do things if you've never tried it, or you don't know anything about it. So, we're going to get a cat. Here's a cat. <laughs> and the Sorry. other way around is you can't, uh, you can't tell them not to do it. Right. Cats are, right. Cats are carnivores. Right. So right. There you yeah. go. Yeah. And, and that was one of the big reasons we had a particularly one friend who was doing this, who had a lot of physical issues and they, they went straight carnivore, what they called uh, straight T-Rex. Yeah. The, the yeah. T-Rex diet. Yeah. The T-Rex diet. And we saw how much he improved and we thought, you know, we should do this just to experiment on ourselves so that we can speak to it when someone asks us questions. Right. We had gotten back from the low carb conference, uh, out in San Diego, and we uh, heard uh, Dr. Georgia uh, East talk. It, that was the West Palm Beach. Was it, was it, well, yeah. it was August when we're talking about Disney went. Yeah, yeah. So, and we we had recently came back from the one in August, and a, a friend of mine that we had been trying to help had asked us just out of the blue, "Hey, do you think we need to eat vegetables?" And I was like, "Well, as a matter of fact, I just got back from the low carb conference, and there was a lot of information that says we might not need to." So that's when he chose to do the, you know, the T, his, what he called the T-Rex diet, and it worked out very well for him. So we started saying, well, if it worked well for him, why don't we do it, like Melody said, to see how it affects us so we can speak to blood work, we can speak to uh, sleep and energy levels and uh, the myth of scurvy and you're going to get uh, compacted, all those things that we had heard people tell you of why you should not eat meat and kind of disprove some of those myths. Okay. So next question then is how easy or difficult was it? And because um, I know you, we started out, it was going to be a month experiment. It got extended at least another two months after that. So uh, we're day 70 today. Oh. Today is day 70. And you're still on it. We are still doing okay. it. So, t yeah. so tell us how, so when you started, how hard was it? Oh, it's, it's very easy. Uh, we, you know, as you know, we, we'd already been keto for about three years. So, uh, we, you know, we already were familiar with most of the foods. We just had the little bit of fruits, the low sugar fruits and vegetables uh, added in there. So basically, you were just taking things away that you were uh, eating uh, you know, that, that were healthy and just to see uh, how it affects you. Proposed healthy. Proposed yeah. healthy. <laughs> and so you were just, you were uh, limiting your diet. So I'll let Melody speak to the preparation of the cooking because she does all that. Um, for me, I thought it was going to be really difficult because I do love vegetables or I did love vegetables so much. I was probably the person who had more vegetables on the plate and meat was the condiment. Kind of more of the uh, keto paleo approach where you eat, you know, lots of leafy greens and a little bit of meat and a lot of fat. That was kind of the way I approached my diet. Um, a lot of fermented vegetables, things like that. and as we started to do this, I thought, well, I'm going to really miss that. For me, the, the difference in texture of food. And as you know, a former chef, that was kind of one thing. All the different textures and layers of your meal was kind of a big deal. And then also going through the nutritional therapy program um, at the NTA, learning all the different ways that vegetables can uh, and different foods like 
that can benefit you, I was concerned that I would really miss those foods. But after about the second day of eating ribeyes at night, I realized that everything else was just kind of fluff and that the ribeyes were so good with all the butter that I really, everything else was sort of a filler. And what I was concerned about was how this would affect the gut health. And do you want to talk a little bit about that? It, it does change your gut microbiome and you notice it. Uh, just like when, when you would uh, switch from the standard American diet to keto diet, there are some changes in your digestive issues of, uh, you know, yeah. when you have, when you go to the bathroom, your poop basically. And that happens as well when you go carnivore, because what we'd heard is you have to have fiber. Like you got to have fiber in your diet, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out you don't really have to have fiber. You still go to the bathroom just fine. Mm -hmm. And it, it even gets, um, your stool changes. It got very liquid for a while. And then, and then it morphs into something different. Like you have, you still go to the restroom and you still poop, but it's just not this, this massive compacted, huge poop of vegetables, <laughs> you know, like, you know, you have a We're pretty graphic, you poop a log and that's your, you know, for guys, that's our babies. Oh, look at my baby. <laughs> um, uh, it doesn't happen. You have these small, uh, small poops that kind of come out and you're like, well, is that it? Is that all I got to do? And yeah. We compare a lot. No, but. hey, but you know what? This is it's kind of an icky subject, I suppose, that people skirt around, but it's something that's it's really important. And I know right. in, the, in the the training program, the coaching program that, that we did, I've got a huge section there on I called it the scoop on poop or something. Yeah, yeah. This is like a you know, a touchy subject, but let's, you know, let's talk about it openly. And yeah. this, I, I, I got most of my information from a, um, a really, really good um, researcher, Russian guy. And, I, you know, there's not a lot of people that, that research this because it's not the greatest thing to, to be researching and talking about. Um, but his, his big thing was the same thing. It's like this whole thing about fiber is a fallacy. It's complete rubbish. What it does is back you up even more. I and mean, you take more laxatives and people are taking more and more and more laxatives and they're eating more and more and more fiber. And, that, and it's just like a, you do one and you have to do more of the other. It just keeps going. Um, right. Well, you know, what we kind of figured out through this and through research, and we, we've listened to a lot of different people who have been doing this for a while, like Amber O'Hearn, right. um, listened to some lectures by Dr. Barry Groves on the carnivorous diet and uh, what we were really meant to eat. And just going through those things and hearing that learning one thing was that all of our recommendations, because people are like, you need fiber because, you know, dietary recommendations say you need this 25, what is it? 25 grams of fiber a day. Right. These are all based on a very high carbohydrate diet in a low fat diet, our regular dietary recommendations. So the vitamin C levels that we're prescribed or told that we need to have is all, you know, based upon that high carbohydrate intake. So that was the one thing, you know, again, being compacted was one uh, myth. The other one was you're going to get scurvy if you don't eat any fruits. Right. Well, what we, you know, we did our research and found out that if, if you're not eating uh, sugar or carbohydrates, you don't need as much vitamin C as you would if you're on the standard American diet because uh, if you have high glucose levels, and then it blocks your consumption or absorption of vitamin C. So if you don't have those high glucose levels all the time, then you absorb vitamin C better, so you need less of it to operate. Right. And I think that's, that's a lot of... Um I don't know if you were there in Florida, in West Palm Beach this, in January, but I don't know if you heard George's talk, but um, you know, a lot of this thing about all these nutrients that are, that are in these plants is that, yes, but they, they're not bioavailable. And there's right. other enzymes and toxins and stuff in the plants that actually prevent your body from, from actually absorbing it. Um, exactly. Um, you're not getting that with meat, I'm assuming, right? Right. You know, one example of that is when people will tell you spinach is a great source of iron mm -hmm. and it is, but it's the non-absorbable form of iron, the non-heme iron. So even though it has iron in it, it's very difficult for your body to get to that iron. Whereas if you eat fresh beef, it is heme iron, 
for the most part. It, it's a mix of non-heme and heme iron. However, the heme iron in it is completely bioavailable and you're able to absorb it and utilize it. Whereas mm -hmm. in the spinach, it's locked up in the cellulose and we don't have that enzyme to open up that cellulose and get to it. So right. it is very interesting that we have, I say it leads back to a lot of religious influence to where eating meat is actually a form of a, a, pro, a product of punishment and garden of Eden is, you know, this idea of purity and, Peace, but when we have to kill animals, it's this idea of punishment. So we have this stigma against eating meat and that we should eat all these vegetables that really just bleeds through our society. And it's very interesting when you get down into the science that there's a lot of nutrients we can't even utilize in these, in these forms of food. Yeah, and my, uh, just to go back to the Garden of Eden thing, um, my, th my take on that is that everything came off the rails once they ate the apple, right? <laughs> so don't eat apples. <laughs> right. Don't eat apples. <laughs> well, from an anthropological standpoint, uh, I did a lot of research, and uh, Dr. Weston Price did, did uh, he visited primitive racial stocks that had not come in contact with the modern diet, and they were still on their native diet, and most of what they consumed was animal products, whether they were by the sea or they lived up uh, in Alaska or they were the Plains Indians. They survived off mostly animal products. They ate some fruits and vegetables, but only at those times that it was available in season. But most of the time, what all the vitamins and minerals they were getting was from all animal products. Right. Awesome. So, um, you were going to do 30 days and now it's on day 70. So are you doing that just because it's working well or just because you want to extend the experiment because you didn't get scurvy or <laughs> what, what, what uh, well, we had our blood tested at day 32, which we have, uh, we finally got our results in. Yeah, yeah. been waiting for that. Yeah. But we, we finally got those. Uh, and that was just to see if we were deficient in any vitamins or minerals on the blood chart that we would need. Right. And it came back as... Everything was really optimal. As keto people, you're going to expect your cholesterol is not going to be what your doctor wants to see. Right. But um, as far as ratios in our cholesterol, things like that, we're, we were good. Steve's was just a little bit off from what it would normally be because he had a cold right before we had our blood work done. So his LDL, which we totally expected, was a little bit elevated. But um, his HDL, his triglycerides, everything came back wonderful. Mine yeah. came back great. Um, did you get particle size done for the LDL? We did. We did. And oh, so overall, my total cholesterol, which is what you normally get, actually went down some. Right. Mm -hmm. So my total cholesterol went down some. My numbers within on the uh, lipid profile changed a bit. Like you said, my LDL was higher than it was before. Um, but you know, doing the ratios, it was fine. But all his LDL particle size came from large fluffy. Right. So at the end of the day, a. yeah. So, so, so everything on our blood work checked out to be awesome. Yeah. We both had large pattern a, uh, lap of, uh, LDL and, uh, everything like we have, and I know the keto people know about this, the, uh, Dawn phenomenon. Right. So when we have our fasting blood glucose done, we run a little higher than our doctor is expecting. Um, so we run, a, uh, do you have yours? I have. Mine was 98. Okay. Yours was 98. So Mine my, was 93. So that's that. If you hear uh, keto people talk about the Dawn effect is, is they have a little bit higher blood glucose levels when they do uh, their a blood fasting, work, a blood fasting blood glucose. Blood work. But however, we test our, our glucose levels, uh, you know, after meals and we have very little to no uh, blood sugar spikes when we eat. So, so what's interesting about the blood sugar, which I know a lot of people are concerned about is that as a keto person, when I wake up in the morning, I test my blood all the time because I have a keto mojo and, right, yeah. and I can. And so if I get up like the morning of our blood draw i got up and i tested my fasting blood sugar and it was 80 in the morning when i first got up that was like at 6 30 in the morning our blood draw wasn't until 10 o'clock by the time we got to our blood draw my blood glucose had risen 
to 93. So what I've noticed is the longer we go without eating in the morning, the higher our blood glucose uh, is at a fasting level during that fasting time. And then as soon as we eat, it goes back down into that 70s and 80s, 70s, range. 80s which, which is what it normally is. And what's your understanding in uh, the cause of that uh, dawn effect thing? What, did, what do you guys... Well, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of people out there that are still researching it. And I think they're gathering... Uh, what I've heard in the grapevine is that they're trying to gather as much information from ketogenic people as possible because it would lead to a new set of parameters, blood work parameters for ketogenic people because it is different. And the reason why is there's the glucose sparing effect of being on a ketogenic diet. So in the morning, um, you have a little more circulating blood glucose. And the full explanation of that, I can't really give, but I know someone like Dr. Adam Nally has talked about it extensively. Right. I think so part of some of what I've heard is that, especially if you're burning more fat, that um, in breaking down those triglycerides, you've got that glycerol backbone left over. And it's that, that part that is used in the gluconeogenesis process to produce glucose. So if, you, if you're using a lot of fat because you're fasting, then, um, you know, that may, it means that those glycerol backbones are available for for gluconeogenesis and that that could be where at least some of it's coming from right uh, we did some research i couldn't find anything concrete on this exactly why it happens and as you know we're all we're all individuals so there could be different reasons for why no, it, that's true it elevates. but uh you know my doctor wanted to do he wanted to do a glucose tolerance test and i said uh i said i don't think that's a good idea because i don't take any any carbohydrates so if you give me he wanted to give me 75 grams of <laughs> glucose at one time and I'm like man you're gonna you're gonna make me feel I'll, I'll feel horrible for one thing and then the results there's no telling what it'll be but it'll be completely inaccurate right well and it would be just miserable because like you said we are we don't take in any sugar so no, that would be that would, that's just be like and, total poison at this stage right well in his his a1c is underneath the you know I think yours was five my, my, five, my a1c is 5.6 5.6 so, and mine's 5.1 and he wanted to do a glucose tolerance test and we were like no we don't think so 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 we, we've uh decided to continue doing it number one i think is just because simply of how easy it is to do cooking wise it's so simple yeah, <laughs> i've become <true>. really lazy <laughs> so we went we went camping a couple weeks ago and when you go camping you know you got to put all your food in that small camping fridge and it was so much easier to just buy the meat and stick it in there opposed to having to stuff a bunch of, you know, vegetables and they take up so much room and yeah. they, you know, they don't once you cook them they're they don't give you a whole lot. So it was so much easier just to put meat in the fridge and, and eat meat, eggs and bacon. It was super easy. Awesome. So uh, are you, are you thinking about kind of doing this on an ongoing basis? Like are you, are you thinking you're going to stay this way or well, I went to the grocery store today and I didn't buy a single vegetable. So this week it's, it's meat only. Looking like it's going that way. Looking like it's going to be meat only this week. Yeah. And you know, we have been fast. So, so we, we don't have a breakfast to worry about, which is great. And we've been doing that for a while. So we really only had to worry about those two meals a day and we treat lunch as our breakfast. So that's mostly eggs and bacon or sausage and a pork chop. And then just having a steak for dinner, it never gets old and it's always good. Yeah. So yeah. far, I haven't, I thought I would get tired of it. I really thought that it would get kind of boring, but it's, it, so far it just hasn't. It's, it's really interesting. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. So um, in terms of uh, Tactical Kitchen and all your keto friends, um, are you going to become like Amber and, and, uh, morph into a carnivore type site or are you going to continue to support uh, well, the, 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 some of us regular keto folk? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that we have stayed very deeply into ketosis through this mm -hmm. and we've kept our, I, I don't like to track, but I love the chronometer or chronometer. I'm not sure how you say it. 
Um, I love their site. And so last week I did log my food and we stay at about 75% fat and 25% protein through this whole experience. So ketone levels, I've taken pictures when we've tested our ketones and we're like, he's always, almost always over 2.0. Right. And so to say that we would not be in the keto world, <laughs> I think we're, we're more keto now than we have been. We just have really, it's really given us the chance to have room for a little more fat. Our yeah. protein hasn't been crazy. I think the highest my protein has been is 106 grams for the day. And uh, everything else is fat. It's fat, yeah. No, not what I really was referring to was like, um, you know, I think a lot of the people that follow you are not necessarily going to, at least not initially, want to try the carnival thing. But right. so you're kind of supporting a lot of people that, that are still eating vegetables or some vegetables at least. Absolutely. Um, and so, and the reason I ask that is um, one of our friends that, used to used to follow your site says i've stopped following melody because she just talks about meat <laughs> um, oh no <laughs> don't do that so, uh, i want to try and encourage you to come back to you that that's it's, although this is what you're doing that you do you're not saying that everybody has to be this way and that um, no we're, we are not and as you know we're not militant about you have to eat this way because this is the way it works uh we're very much in finding out how what works best for the person, not we're not keto to be keto, we're not carnivore to be carnivore. There they are experiments to see how it affects our health. So if we have someone that's you know that wants to go ketogenic, we can talk them you know talk them down that path and and teach them how to do it and and understand because we've done it. And then also if somebody's like, hey, I don't really like vegetables, I want to eat all meat. Is that okay? Now we can intelligently speak to it and say, uh -huh. yeah, it's absolutely fine. We did it. We had no issues with our blood work. We just have kind of continued doing it because it, it's very easy and we like to keep things simple. Uh, and I think we think everybody should, you know, do that, keep everything as simple as possible. That way it's not hard. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, no, we totally support, you know, anybody that if, you know, if you want to be vegan keto, if you want to eat all mm -hmm. fruits and vegetables and try to be keto, we understand that as well. So absolutely eat what makes you feel the best and what you uh, like to eat as long as it keeps you within those healthy parameters. Right. And that's, I think, I'm, I'm still looking for good resources for, to help the vegans, you know, because we get vegans that come along and they, they have, I, I can't challenge their ethical or religious reasons for mm -hmm. wanting to be vegan. Right. Um, and and uh, all I can do is do whatever I can to, to support them and find a way for them to still be keto and stay vegan. Um, you know, if they want to argue that, that the vegan diet is more healthy than uh, than any other kind of diet, then, then I'll, I'll argue with them all day. But, you know, there are people that have legitimate religious and ethical um, reasons for wanting to be to eat that way. And um, right. so, yeah, if you come across any really good resources and, uh, for, for supporting keto as a vegan, I'd, I'd love you to shove them our way so we can help people with that too. Yeah. I do know, do you remember the doctor's, the person's name who was on Jimmy's podcast? That's no, a vegan? I, don't, I don't recall her name, but I know she was, she was doing vegan keto. And I've heard of right. some other people doing uh, vegan keto. Uh, they just really have to be on it. I mean, they really got to be. Uh, a on, lot of supplementation it. as well, right? Uh, Probably so. I think that, uh, I think it's just difficult to get those B vitamins that come from animal sources. There's, there's just a lot of tweaking you have to do to be able to get, I don't think the fat is a huge problem because right. of coconut oil and avocados and that. Exactly. And, yeah. You can get your fat. Um, it's just a matter of it's, getting the, it's the nutrients like the B vitamins and getting a good source of protein when you're not going for an animal based protein to, you know, to make sure that you're not deficient in any of those areas. And, and avoiding all the, what we consider to be digestive issues that come with having to your body, having to process all of those plants. Well, that was one of the reasons we tried this out because, you know, as, as you heard, our, our bodies are set up to process meat right? and it does it very well. And oftentimes when you, when you talk to people that have, uh, they're constipated or they're bloated 
lot of times they eat a lot of fruits and vegetables or grains, and that's what adds that bulk to your poop, and that's what causes you to be back up. Right. Yeah, totally. And it's a great elimination diet. Like for anyone who can't really figure out what's going on with their body, when you narrow it down to where you're eating almost like one source of something, you can then do that for a little while. And then when you add something back in, you know immediately if that food is a negative, having a negative effect on you. And we did that because we really, we really love uh, that we live close to a raw milk dairy. And so we like to take advantage of that because I personally think it's a, a wonderful natural food source full of good things. Mm -hmm. But while doing this and we went and purchased the raw milk and I added that in just like a glass a day or so, I broke out with eczema on my legs and it was very easy to figure out that it was the raw milk. Right. And, then, I mean, there's, and there's still a bunch of carbs in, you know, and even full cream milk. Um, you know, that's why when we, here in our house, we, we go with the, we just use like the heavy cream and stuff like that. And we find mm -hmm. the one from Trader Joe's and wherever that have, you know, less than one gram of carbs per serving sort of thing. So um, that, that eliminates that issue. I, the, the thing with full cream milk is that, yeah, it's maybe nice, but, but, in moderation, even if you don't break out an eczema, it's still adding a bunch of carbs into your... I had I had room for the carbs since we weren't doing anything but right. me. So I thought, well, I'll give it a try. And it, it was, you know, and the case for that is that I have a gluten intolerance. And if I have gluten, I break out in a bilateral rash. And I know that. Right. And knowing that casein, milk, the milk protein and gluten are very similar, my immune system recognizes casein as gluten. Okay. So I, that's why I have the breakout. And it was really interesting to see that happen, although it was a little miserable for a week or so. Um, I had to take it back out and it takes a few days for that to kind of like that flare up to go down. But I would say for anyone with, with certain skin disorders or issues or digestive problems that doing a really strict elimination diet is like gold standard for finding out what is affecting you yeah. negatively. And like you said, I mean, if you're just eating uh, meat and bacon and, and eggs. That's like, um, it's, it's kind easy of, to figure out how food yeah, is. And, and it, all your issues clear up and you add stuff in one at a time until you work out what it is. Exactly. One thing that we thought would be disrupted was possibly sleep because, um, you know, when you change your diet, sometimes you can have sleep disruptions. But one thing that we did notice is that our sleep actually improved. It did. I sleep like a rock. I mean, she'll tell you, I lay down within two or three minutes. I close my eyes. I'm dead to the world. I'm mm -hmm. out. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that both of us were – pretty consistent with waking up at least once or twice during the night to have to go to the restroom. Mm -hmm. And throughout this whole thing, we've noticed that n n neither one of us wake up during the night to do that anymore. We sleep through the night and most of the time I'll either wake up naturally right before the alarm goes off or I'll sleep until the alarm goes off like I did this morning. And I I've been really surprised by that because usually people, you know, I mean, we're in our late forties. So by that time, you know, we're all getting up during the middle of the night to go to the restroom, right? Yeah, <laughs> so no, absolutely. That was a, that that's was a, a really deal. interesting improvement because that quality of sleep where you don't wake up through the night, I thought that that was like not ever going to happen again. Yeah, that's golden. It really is. That's awesome. Um, and for me, she talked about the milk. The, uh, the big thing that I, that I got away from that, uh, you know, take away from the milk was uh, I was having, I have an arthritic knee. It's been, you know, I had ACL, uh, MCL surgery done on it. So it's, it's a very problematic knee and it had, and it was getting worse and I couldn't figure out why it was hurting all the time. And this started back in November, just a constant ache and it just kept getting worse and worse. And when we started talking about it, I realized that we started adding milk back in November. That's when we started purchasing it again. And in the last couple of weeks, I had uh, increased my intake. I was drinking two big glasses of milk a day. And when we went camping, my knee just was aching. It was horrible. So we were talking about it, and I was like, maybe I should take the milk out and see if that affects it. 
within about three days, all knee pain went away. That's crazy. And, and in the past couple of days, it's been almost a hundred percent where I thought, you know, I'm, I was staring down the uh, knee replacement surgery because I just couldn't get it to fix. And then I went out today, I ran intervals with, uh, you know, a couple of the young kids and it feels absolutely fine. <laughs> and that's just since I removed the milk. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Really, really good information as well for people to, you know, who's struggling. I'm, <clears throat> we leave tomorrow to go to Australia, um, see my parents and the rest of my family. And um, I know my folks are, especially my dad's really, really struggling with um, pain in his fingers and his wrists and stuff like that. And he's very obstinate, but I'm, you know, it's always hardest to get your family to, to, to understand that this is something worth trying. Yeah. But since we're actually going there, I'm hoping that I can face him face to face and, and convince him to at least try it because that's a thing. Dr. Michael Eads, um, I asked him about some uh, chronic illness or something uh, and whether the, the keto diet would help for that once what, a couple of years ago. And his response to me was like, it's so easy to try. And it within days, you're going to see a benefit or not and so try it for a couple of days and see i mean you know worst thing is that you're going to suffer through a delicious food for three for, for three to five days um to you know okay so you're not having pasta and rice but with all the awesome things you can eat like ribeye mm -hmm. steak um like <laughs> you know who cares that's what we tell people all the time. What do you have to lose? You have nothing to lose. If you're yeah. already, if you're already in a miserable state, you're not going to get worse. Exactly. And it can only get better. And if it gets better, then it might be motivation for you to, to stick with it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, good luck with that. Yeah. yeah thanks. Talking to parents is always difficult. I just had to talk to my mom recently. So. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, guys, that's really cool. I, um, Looking forward to seeing you in, in July. You're coming in July? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Brilliant. So we'll see you yeah. there. We'll probably do something in person there as well. Maybe a follow-up. That might even be, what, 130 days or 20 days or something by then. Yeah, we'll see. Um, so far, we haven't made plans to reintroduce anything yet yeah well let's but. see let's see where it goes and we'll never follow up and either you haven't stuck with it or you have and either way it'll be interesting to hear uh, right where, where you are and it, you know I thought it would be it will be interesting if we do start reintroducing foods because then you have another shift in your digestion so that's that's always interesting to see right. how it affects yeah, because if, if you do go back and start introducing these things, your whole gut biome is going to change. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. so, right. Who knows? It might change for the worse, and you'll go back to what you're doing now. Yeah. I agree. It's cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you in July in person. We do too. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Doug. Yeah.